Welcome to the Leadership Conversations podcast. I'm your host, Jono White. I'm the founder and principal consultant of Clarity. We are an Australian-based consultancy that works with leaders around the world, and our passion is to invest in people to become everything they're meant to be in order to fill the world with healthy organizations that people love to work for and customers line up to buy from. The goal of this podcast is to invest in you and your leadership. If you're just joining us for the first time, then feel free to check out consultclarity.org. That's our website, consultclarity.org. We have so many free resources on there. The most popular being our seven questions on leadership series. We've had more than 1,500 leaders from around the world in all different sectors give their in-depth answers on leadership, what books they love, what they found most challenging, uh, the most meaningful stories, how they how they structure their time through the day. That's free, so go and check it out. And we'd love to interview you about your leadership. I believe you have advice from your experience, your context, and your life so far that is important and can help other leaders. It's also a great way to give back. It's free to get involved, and you can do so by going to consultclarity.org forward slash seven dash questions dash interest, or just Google consultclarity.org seven questions interest and fill out the form that pops up. We have a free resource for you on our website. It's called Leadership Survival Guide. It's a 57 page ebook. It has interviews with 10 world class leaders, and you can go to consultclarity.org. It's right at the top and get that today. Uh, we also have a daily email that we send out to over 15,000 leaders, and that email contains the highlights our best content from our podcasts, our blog, uh, my book, uh, the books that we're loving that are out there about leadership. It's also the best way to get access to our masterclasses and workshops before anyone else. And there's also exclusive and limited uh, special options just for subscribers. And you can subscribe by going to consultclarity.org forward slash subscribe. Now my gift to you is to work incredibly hard to provide the best leadership content I can to invest in you and your leadership. So if you're finding our content helpful, if you find this podcast helpful, then your gift to me uh, could be this. If you if you do find it helpful, then write a review or rate our content and make sure you subscribe or follow. I can't emphasize enough how helpful that is. It really does help us to get the word out there so we can invest in more leaders to become everything they're meant to be. It also means a lot to me personally when people like you and people in our community share our content on social media. So if you do that, then please do look for me, Jono White, to tag me and look to tag Clarity uh, on whatever platform you're on. And our team, including me, I'm always looking to see when people have mentioned us so that I can engage with you. And also we look at sharing content. So if you if you write something about something we've done, there's also a good chance we'll share that with our followers. So if you could do that, that is a massive, massive help as we try to invest in as many leaders as we can around the world. Last of all, you can check out my book about how to deal with difficult people even if you hate conflict. It's called Step Up or Step Out. It's available on Amazon. You can just look up Step Up or Step Out John O'White or you can go to store.consultclarity.org forward slash book and check it out there. I have coached leader after leader after leader and in more than 50% of the sessions, this topic comes up. How do I deal with this person? I'm finding it really difficult and, and I just want to find a way that doesn't blow up to do a really, just to have a difficult conversation, to lead them better. How do I do that? There's a three-step process that I outline in this book that I believe can help you. Okay, let's get into today's episode of the Leadership Conversations podcast. Enjoy. Welcome to the episode of the Leadership Conversations podcast. Today's guest is Rachel Horton. Rachel is principal of the Armadale School, also known as TAS. Welcome to the podcast, Rachel. Thanks very much, Jono. Good to be here. Yeah, I've been looking forward to chatting with you. First of all, can you tell our listeners about what you do? 
even though I just gave a quick intro. <laughs> yes. So, um, yes, I'm, I'm principal of, uh, of TAS. Um, I'm actually still in my first year at TAS. I started um, officially the 1st of July last year, and this is my first principalship. But um, a little bit about our school, I guess. We're in regional New South Wales in Armadale, and we have around 655 students from pre kindy to all the way through to year 12. And we're a boarding school with about 225 boarders. And we also, for the past, this is our seventh year of being co-educational. Used to be a boys' school, but now um, a co-ed regional boarding school. Um, so I guess as mm. principal, I have sort of um, overall responsibility for um, all of our students, staff, and, and um, engagement with our broader community as well. That's really important to us here at TAS. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you for giving us a bit of an overview. Uh, so let's start with your childhood as we find out a bit about your story, Rachel. What are some of the moments from uh, for you that really shaped you becoming the person and the leader you are today? Um, I, I actually think, I think anyone who knows me, Jono, would, might put my number one characteristic as um, competitive. And uh, I, I try to think about where this has come from uh, quite a lot. And I, I know that I was quite a, a competitive um, child. And, and I think that came up from my parents giving me a lot of opportunities, quite a lot of them outside of school as well. But I grew up um, uh, in the country. We had horses. I rode and was a member of the pony club. So we sort of um, went to Jim Carners when I was very young and then was involved in to triathlon, which is running, riding, shooting and swimming. And I think... I have distinct memories when I was in my early teens of running to the end of our lane and back every evening. And my mom would write our times, my times down on a piece of paper and put it above um, our uh, Arga stove in the kitchen and, and keep track of my times. So I have to sort of um, credit my credit or blame either way, my parents with me being competitive. But certainly that's, that's definitely a part of, of who I am. And I guess in terms of my competitiveness and leadership, I think what that brings is that as a leader, I care deeply about those people I'm leading and I'm sort of competitive on their behalf, if, if, that, makes, if that makes sense. Um, yeah. 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 I, I guess the other thing is I also, uh, the potentially another sort of formative thing when I was growing up is when I was 15, my parents separated, which was um, obviously the, the case for quite a, unfortunately, a, a lot of young people, but that um, mm. was a bit of a shock to me. And uh, I think has probably uh, influenced my independence and, and my drive. I just sort of... Um, got on and and did things and and became quite an independent um young lady i guess at the time yeah yeah i really appreciate you sharing that um i often will be working with teams and do an exercise around uh sharing something from childhood um, that was a unique or difficult challenge which the exercise isn't mine it comes from patrick it's really simple mm -hmm. but it's it's a fantastic way to build vulnerability in a team and I always try to go first as the facilitator because I, I feel like if I'm going to push everyone into that sort of zone, I should go. And um, I often talk about the, uh, uh, for me, that I was, um, you know, 13, 14, when my parents separated and um, how I had no idea at the time. But then as you get older, you realize, oh, wow, I actually think, um, you know, that that was a really, that did actually have a big impact on me. and uh, and one thing that I often mention with teams is I remember uh, it's not once again, like you said, there's a lot of people listening who would have gone through something similar. I, yeah. I remember one of my best friends, actually my best friend, you know, I, I didn't tell them uh, a couple of my best friends. I didn't even tell them that my parents had been separated for a year because I think I was embarrassed about it. I just didn't know how to have that conversation. Their parents were together. And, um, but at the time you don't realize any of that. You just, 14 or 15 right and uh but mm -hmm. then you get older and you look back and go hmm that probably was one of the most uh um, things in in my in my life growing up yeah i think so definitely and i think i sort of um 
you can take it in different ways. And the, the way I took it was I'm sort of going to go out on my own and, and do all these things. And uh, mm. I mean, maybe that was a really positive thing for me because that's come through into sort of my later life. And um, I've had a, a very much a, yes, I'll have a go at that attitude and a sort of push myself and, and try different things. And I do think if you have to pinpoint a moment, it probably stemmed from that. Um, so sad, sad as it was, um, and, and always is when a relationship um, sort of ends, uh, I think it's in the end had a, a positive outcome for me. Yeah. You mentioned about being competitive and I always, I love chatting with leaders and um, encouraging leaders around this idea of leveraging how you're wired. And, and I always talk with leaders who are real to-do list people and they're trying really hard to be this just, you know, a sort of relational person. And, and I often say, if you're such a to-do list person, building connection, like create a to-do list for it and literally make times to go and people and connect with them and con and get in contact with stakeholders and, and so I, I love sort of to zoom in on those parts of themselves that so I, I love hearing you talk about being good to know what what does that look like what do you feel what what advantage uh, does that give you and how you see the world as a leader coming into a school there must be some interesting I, I imagine there'd be some interesting strength that come from that from all the way back when you were little and then making those times running up and down the driveway um, <laughs> leadership today look I, I think I think sort of um, being in the wonderful position being principal of the school what it what it means is that um, I want the very best and I will do whatever is required to get the very best for my team my school my community and I think for me that's that's how it plays out in, in terms of leadership. Um, I think interesting in, in what you say and sort of leveraging your, um, your natural bent, so to speak, because I do set myself, I actually just um, set myself the target of knowing 90% of our student names by the end of this term. Um, and so I, I do set myself sort of goals and targets in terms of relationships and other things as well. And that does also play into my competitive side, only competing against myself, of course. So, um, yeah. Uh, yes, I definitely do those sorts of things. Lists, goals, <laughs> targets personally, and then yes. um, just sort of feeling like I want the best for everyone and to sort of compete on behalf of the whole school. Um, really it sounds a little bit odd but that is sort of how i feel about it no i, I really get what you're saying because it's that difference uh you know say in sports versus individual sports and um i think it's always amazing when you see a really healthy ego on someone who's in an individual sport like tennis you think roger federer mm -hmm. um or ash Barty, you know closer closer to home you think that's not easy because it's such an individual sport. I think it's much easier to have that mentality you're talking about when you are in a team because you are um, competing, but that competition is for us as as a team. And so the I, yeah, I really get what yeah. you're com competing, but competing for us, for us as a school, for for all of these kids, yeah. for their for their parents, for the community. Yeah, absolutely. I might I just. I have feel I have to say something on your comment on sport as well. I was talking to a wonderful young lady at Taz the other day about her sports and her main sports and netball and, and swimming. So we talked about the team versus the individual sport and a lot of our conversation centered around the fact that while swimming is a, an individual sport in the pool, it takes a huge team to get you there. So I think young people really get it when they realize that it might be an individual race, but it is still a team sport. And she feels immense pride also in representing her school, but she recognizes the team of the, the coaches, parents driving you places, the people who make your food, all of those things. And I thought that was, um, I, I think people have really, things have really clicked when people realize that not very much is fully individual. Yeah, absolutely. I love that. That's a, and awesome that she can be, uh, you know, having those conversations at a, at a young age. age. Um, so I'm interested to know, Rachel, what, 
you know, as as we all think about leadership and our opportunities in leadership, I, I love getting people to look back and think, when were first in the deep end as a leader? When did you first take something on where you were, it was your first opportunity with managing people, having direct reports, or even just a project or something that you were really uh, responsible for? Do you remember one of the first chances you had that was a real leadership opportunity where you still sort of felt like you were in the deep end and, and really learning this st- thing called leadership as you do it? Yeah, yeah, John, I, I, I was really in the deep end, but I might, I'll, um, the first thing is everyone assumes that I would have been a leader or a prefect at school, and I wasn't at school. I never had any leadership. I wasn't even sort of vice library monitor or something like that. So I, when I got to university, I captained my rugby team, and that was sort of a lead by example kind of thing. But um, I got involved with the um, Army Reserves, and I was a member of the um, Territorial Army Royal Engineers. And in 2003, um, I was commissioned. I went to Sandhurst. I was an officer in the engineers. And in 2003, we got compulsorily mobilized to go to Iraq. And I was posted to Iraq for a a six-month tour. And really, although I'd learned a lot about sort of leadership theory and and I captained my rugby team, I hadn't really had to lead people in any real way, shape or form before then. And I just landed one night in Basra. I didn't even know what job I was getting posted or what role I was being posted into. I was just hoping that someone would be expecting me. And I got um, collected um, from the airport and taken to our camp. And um, the next morning I find I was um, going to be ops officer for the headquarters squadron of the British Army Engineer Regiment out there at the time um, for the next six months. So that was really sort of truly in at the deep end with my first sort of serious leadership um, (laughs) role. And it very much is sink or swim. You can't sort of play around with that and and just, you know, it's it's, a... pretty high stakes so um i did my best and um yeah. that's incredible talk <laughs> yeah. about high stakes it doesn't get any higher than that like i always ask people no. about the deep end but rarely is it a, where you almost go into a life or death situation which is you know if you're part of the military and you're overseas it's it's um yeah talk about high stakes what were the biggest mm-hmm. lessons you learned in those six months that i'm sure must have been incredibly formative for you as a as a leader and as a person Um, I think the biggest lesson for me, one thing I didn't learn until I left, actually, I assumed that everyone would be doubting me because I was a reservist who'd been posted into a regular army unit. And I assumed also as a woman in the engineers, there were no other uh, women or there was a signaler and a cook. Everyone else was men. I thought I would have to try harder and prove myself more and I think reflecting on that when I came home, that was not the case. That was my projection. But I also then realized that actually no one realized I was posted in from the reserves. They just thought I'd come in from another regular unit. So I didn't have to overcome that either. But in terms of leadership, it made it, I think, sort of um, absolute honesty with everyone uh, and admitting if you make a mistake um, and being open, honest, and trusting in the skills of those around you. I was in the engineers, and I am not a qualified engineer. I've done some military engineering courses, but I didn't do an engineering degree. I'm a microbiologist. So you have skilled people around you to ask the questions of, to, to help put plans together, um, and so trusting them. But also, if you if you make a mistake, being open and honest to admitting that you made a mistake. I, I think that's probably the biggest thing that's, um, that's, that stuck with me. Um, mm. Mm. Yeah, it's really, it's really important. And I, and I also should say that I was, I, I feel incredibly lucky despite having some big decisions to make that I didn't make any really high stakes mistakes. And I, I really do think that's, that's very lucky, but of course I made lots of, you know, we all make low level missteps now and then so sort of admitting when you've done that is important yeah and i think admitting when you've done that is um is is part of uh how to avoid making the big mistakes because you 
it's that uh, it's that cycle where someone who's willing to say help, uh, hey, I don't know how to do this. They get the help they need, they improve, and it's the cycle is reverse. If someone's not willing to do that, then they don't ask for help on the little things. And and I think mm-hmm. um, I think that's why that trait in leaders and in hiring people, that idea of teachable. Uh, or as Patrick Lencioni calls it, you know, that humility is one of the three ideal team player traits. Humility is so important because if someone's not willing to ask for help or admit mistakes, um, it may not be a big deal in that thing. Things stay hidden or as they don't get the help they need, that's when you things can snowball and create really big alarming problems, um, even just organizationally, say in a school, that you look and you get, oh wow, if that could have that could have been ago, if we had just known X, Y, or Z. Um, so I love that that trait was something that you really felt like you you walked away from that experience, like you, you really yeah. learned that the importance of of being honest about your shortcomings and any mistakes you make and asking for help. That's great. Yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. So through your career so far. I'm interested in who have been some of the mentors or leaders from afar or leaders directly with them who've had the biggest influence on your leadership journey. Donna, it's a really, it's a really hard question. And I think about this an awful lot because where we, where we talk to the students about leadership, quite often we ask them about the leaders they admire or who influences them. And I, I think for me, although I've di- I've worked directly with some amazing people, and I and I have had some amazing mentors. I don't think you can get um, a long way without wonderful people um, mentoring you, supporting you, and 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 being good sounding boards. Um, if I think about someone who I think has really influenced me as a, a leader, I go to someone who well, I have worked with her, and that's. Um, Amy Perrett, who is, a, she's a, a rugby referee from Sydney. Um, she has, she's an international referee, international sevens and fifteens, and she's worked for Rugby Australia for a number of years. She's also the first woman to referee um, super rugby, and she's kicked an awful lot of goals as, as a woman. She's done amazingly. But what I, I take from Amy, I've known her for a very long time, and, and she's a good friend. She's so humble um, and quiet and modest, although she's continually achieving new things and doing wonderful things. But I, she's always, since I've known her, been, I felt like she's been working um, to pave the way for others. And I think that's a really um, impressive trait because I think at the time that I met her, I was, um, I won't say I was selfish, but I didn't really feel that I had that responsibility to um, f- towards others and I didn't necessarily have that sort of social responsibility and I saw it at Amy um, and and I've definitely come to that and I think it's really important to, to make changes so that others can follow and others don't have the sort of challenges that you have. But Amy all along has had that and, and so I'm very impressed that she has always been looking out for others um, mm. in that way and has achieved so very much herself, but being quite um, humble, quiet, persistent. Um, And she would probably be incredibly embarrassed if she knew that I was talking about her because she is so modest about it. So I just, I I genuinely really admire her. um, And, and I think she's a wonderful example. Um, Yeah. Yeah. Wonderful. Um, let me put you on the spot and potentially embarrass her a little bit more. But um, are there any stories of Amy that come to mind? Uh, because I always love asking people about great, great leaders. And she is. I can hear what you said about her, that she's she walks with this humility. Yet yeah. done incredible things and really broken broken through ceilings and, and um, broken new ground. That's amazing. Any story how she handled the situation, advice she gave you? something you watched her um, navigate that's appropriate for <laughs> this. Uh, oh, I am putting you I, in the spot I, here. I love that you said appropriate, Jono, because as rugby referees, and we've had been lucky to travel overseas together, and um, so yeah. there's definitely some stories that are um, uh, probably less appropriate but a lot of fun. Um, but yeah. um, 
I don't know if I can pick one one story um, of yeah I don't know something came to me a minute ago and it's just gone out of out of my mind but I, I think she knows really well you have to pick your battles very well and she's very good at holding holding herself in biting her lip and picking her moment and choosing when to fight and and when not to and I think that's something I don't have a specific example of that for her but um it's something that she a real skill that she has and and something I've taken from her because you can't fight every battle you just don't have the energy to do it so um she's very good at it yeah that is a great um a, that that knowing which battles to pick and, and uh, yeah probably knows how to do that and knows how to let some to use the sports to, analogy you know to get what to let uh through to the keeper so to speak mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. that's uh it's a wonderful thing well um uh, if anyone uh, if amy does end up listening to this i would also love to invite amy to come on the podcast and then we can hear Amy's stories from uh, from so the invitation. Um, if uh, if Amy does uh, does hear about this, um, um, so, so what about, about for you? Can you think of any aha moments, moments in your career across things you've done, uh, Rachel? Obviously, like you said, you've just been at Taz uh, recently, but as an educator, as a scientist, can you think of uh, um, any aha? Penny really dropped for you about something because you, you made a mistake in a lesson or someone did give you some advice about something in a moment that's really stuck with you or you were part of a team that achieved something that you didn't really think was possible. Any any sort of from your career so far? Um, I don't know if it's a moment, but something that's sort of progressively come to me in a, in a series of things over the over time, Jono, is, um, and it might be an age thing as well and getting more comfortable with yourself, but it's about authenticity. And I think as a younger leader, you sort of um, see traits in others and might think, well, that works really well. I'm going to try that. And, and as a woman as well, you sort of might fall into the, well, I've got to lean in and I've got to be this kind of leader and this is what I've got to do. And part of me is comfortable with parts of that, but also, I'm I'm myself, and I'm quite different um, to that. So it's over time. I've just got more comfortable and used to being myself, and also comfortable with the fact that that that's okay, and it's okay to be a different style of leader um, and have a, a different way to. Just because someone else does something really well doesn't mean that that sort of fits with you. And getting used mm. to people. Um, valuing that. Actually, I still find it quite odd that people, I, I genuinely find it quite odd that people think I'm a, a good leader and, and worthy in, I'm very confident that I can do the job, but I still couldn't tell you why people think I'm a good leader, but I have got comfortable with the fact that that's sort of where we're at and uh, people appreciate me, my authentic self rather than anything that I could or, or try to be. Yeah, I, I've i experienced a similar thing. And, and my big question, which I want to put back to you is, um, is there any way for, say you've got leaders listening who, who don't feel like they are able to really be their authentic self yet? I, I'm trying to think for me and I'm going, you know what, I don't know if there's anything else I could have done. I think for me, I just had to do, I had to get out there and lead and do things. And, and it was actually just through the doing that I found ended up going, that's not me. That's not me. This <laughs> I'm trying to be that without even realizing it. Um, I'm actually really bad at that, that I thought I was going to try to do. And, and then you sort of find this is who I am. And then I've been able to sort of settle into that more naturally and be um, even for myself, like a bit dorky. And, and I always love saying my life is that when I'm working, <laughs> it's not this. Um, yeah, yeah. I just love the fact that, that probably 10 years ago, that would be Jono really, really polished and i i still you know i believe in excellence and, and things being great but i i love being able to have relationships and work with people where i can really be jono who does have say really lame jokes and can be really um, um yeah. dorky and that's that's part of who I've, I've i've had to get comfortable with that about myself that's a 
So, yeah, what do you think? Is there anything that you can do to try to be that? Or is it something you just have to walk out? I, I really think it is something that comes with a little bit of trial and error because you're still finding yourself and who you are as a person as as you grow and age and you change as well. I, I've certainly changed from my early 20s to a couple of years later where I am now. But, you know, tw tw early 20s to early 40s is a, is a, has been a big change in me as a person and a lot of that's come with confidence as well. So you, you're sort of, it is a little bit trial and error and I think that's okay as well to try things and, and, and find out if they work for you. Um, I think the other thing is that increasingly we're seeing more diverse styles of leadership and we're seeing that you don't have to fall into this sort of one stereotype of what a leader should be or maybe two or three, but there's there's a real diversity in, in leaders out there now. And I think that that helps because you see that other people can be different. And so if if you are different, then that's okay as well. Yeah, I think you hit the nail on the head there. Uh, well said. Let's jump into some Leadership Express questions. Are you... uh, yes. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I'm ready. I'm ready. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the first one is what's a uh, what's a book, or you can give a couple if, if a couple come to mind that you've gifted to other people or that you've recommended a lot to us. Okay, so I I actually really try hard. I love I love to give books, and I try hard to sort of um, pick the book that I think will suit the person or the the moment that they're in. But in terms of books that I, a book that I gift over and over again to students, staff or friends, it's the book um, Legacy by James Kerr, which talks to the leadership lessons of um, the All Blacks. Again, rugby, there's a rugby theme running through my life, but also business lessons. And there's nothing in there that's really sort of, I would never have thought that, but it's, it's, a, it's a really amazing book in terms of sort of leadership and and building a successful team and what it takes to do that and i uh, it's also a, an easy read which i think is important because otherwise if something's too complex i struggle to get through it but legacy is a great book i think yeah one let's see thank you uh, what about a recent leadership lesson that you've learned for the or been reminded of Mm, that's a trickier one. I think, look, I think the one you, I need to remind myself of all the time, um, and I, I can't necessarily think of a, a time I've, I've learned it, relearned it recently, but it's one that I keep front of mind, is if you want to change something, if you think something should change or you want to do things differently, then whether it's something small or large, you should sort of work out why it's in place in the first place and work out who you might upset if you change it and then decide whether it's it's worth that. I think um, there would be a number of occasions, nothing too catastrophic again, where um, I might have, I, I like to do things quickly. I like to get on a roll. I need to slow down, breathe, work out, who might not like it if I if I make this change and then sort of um, do some work around that and decide whether it, to go ahead or not. And I think that's always something to keep front of mind. Yes, the speed of change is, I'm fascinated with the speed of change because um, I love uh, chatting, chatting with transformational leaders um, and it's always interesting. There's, there's two perspectives people come from where either they're a slower mover and to speed up that's actually been the challenge to 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 push through and when, when they're not sure necessarily or haven't done everything they would have liked to do that we need to take a step to move forward and then you have other leaders mm -hmm. like you've shared there where your natural bent um might be to move faster and the thing i love about that is that is it is horses for courses you moments where um i would be thinking through something like um in the past years, you've continued to navigate uh, COVID that some of that faster pace would be helpful for a new principal coming in. Mm -hmm. uh, I know that, say, for for someone who uh, is on the other end of the spectrum, 
challenge is actually to move faster. I think things like COVID can be really challenging because they have to move very quickly when their natural bent might be to more slowly see change. Oh, take time. So. Totally. And that yeah, was so honest. It, also in, in, in Iraq, that was one of the, I found it actually quite straightforward because you're in a situation where you do need to make quick, high impact, but quick decisions. And similarly with COVID. But yes, I have a post-it, only one post-it note on my computer screen and it says slow down and breathe. And it's my reminder to me all of the time. Not everyone loves that pace as much as I do. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I, I can't remember the exact quote, but there's this great quote about um, leadership, which is um, you, if you lead, you, if, you, if you're not careful and you're far ahead, then you, you're not a leader, you're just a person taking a walk by themselves because there's no one <laughs> yep walking. something like that i haven't quite done yes, it just no. not that idea, but... you sort of punch, yep. push out and um and then if you look around a nice while you're actually just a, a man or a woman. um so yep. yeah that's a that's a wonderful <laughs> wonderful lesson to learn okay another what is a commonly held belief about leadership, leadership. um you know, think sport you can think education you can think more generally leadership what's a commonly held belief that you pass agree with so the, the the general belief might be one thing but rate is quite the opposite yeah perhaps with leadership and it's because i, I we talk to students and our young people about leadership a lot i think um when you start sort of um teaching leadership you talk about different leadership styles and you ask what leadership style they would like to be and I, I feel that some people fall into this trap that you are one or another and that you can't be a combination or you can't sort of change it up for for appropriate um occasions so I guess for me yeah uh, it, what I believe is a common myth about leadership in particular is that you are one style or the other there are some people who are very much but I think most good leaders um, are a combination and switch between different styles um, as appropriate to the occasion, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. Love it. Great. Do you have any favorite questions that you ask uh, when, when you are, are in, in a hiring team, when, when you are in, in a classroom uh, with stakeholders? Okay, is there any question ask people? Um, cause I, because I'm still in my first year at TAS, I've actually been in Armadale 12 days and one year, but I've been principal for, for not quite a year. I'm still in the phase while, while, while things, decisions are being made and, and things are going on, I'm still asking everyone, and that's students, staff and parents, firstly, what they love about TAS, because I think that's really important. You need to know what people love about whatever it is that you're, you're leading. Um, and the other thing is, um, and I particularly enjoy this one with students, I like to ask them if they were me, what would they change? What, and, and do you get some amazing answers to that? Um, so that might change, or I'll still be interested in that over time. But as a, a sort of a relatively new leader to, um, to the school, I think those are really, really important. And I get some really good information from those. Yeah, that's a great question. Someone, I, I can't remember who it was, but another um and he's a ceo and he said that he he loves to um, whenever spend time with employees who are on the front line does i think from memory it was larger large organization. organization um ask people what's the what's the uh you know what, what's the most stupid thing that you in your job or like what's the thing that's ridiculous oh, yeah. if we could just change that one thing it would make your job easier yep just mm -hmm. like that you have to be a pretty brave um and culture where he has people on his team and throughout who are, who are comfortable with the ceo going and asking those questions which um i think that in in and of itself is pretty yeah it's pretty brave but I, I love that sort of idea it's kind of, that's kind of the harsher version of um of what you're asking and going you know what is there what's the like um just trying to see through the eyes of a student in your case or, or a parent and really yeah. understand yeah but also for those in uh, in in uh, uh, say corporate, corporate where you can touch in larger organizations to what on earth is happening is it's actually just asking tell me the the most ridiculous thing about your job that 
um, and I remember hearing another podcast. I think it was actually Dr. Bob. A lot of work with um, employee appreciation. And you just remind me of the story that, uh, which was this company was really not good at receiving the sort of feedback. Exactly. The thing that you just mentioned. And, uh, mm-hmm. and they finally started actually listening to their organization. We're talking once again, thousands of employees, big job to try to help people feel heard. And there was one, um, uh, there was one employee who was working in the postal area who, uh, who said, Oh, look, I think um, we send out this, this massive part of our sort of communications, um, is this, uh, this thing that we post out to everyone and we do it, I can't remember the exact measurements, but it's like, we do it, it's a 16 inch. And if we just made it a 14 inch, we would completely mm-hmm. not have to reset up this whole printing. Like it was this tiny two inch difference yeah. that no one noticed. Yeah, sure. They changed it and it saved the million dollars. And I mean, it was a big company, yeah. but still it was, I wonder what the half a million dollar changes are that I can't see, but my employees or my students in your case, you know, what do they see that would make a massive difference mm-hmm. because we're not in their shoe. Um, so I, I yeah. love that. Question. And quite Especially often they're really, million. quite often they're really simple things like that, Jono as well, which is, yeah. you know, some are more complex, but there are usually little simple things that are quite doable that you can do and make a really big difference to them, which is great. Absolutely. It's also a wonderful, any, any leader who's listening into a new role or has stepped into a new role, it's a great question to ask. So I think that's a, yeah. um, a, a really good encouragement for other leaders out there who are right. newish or stepping into a new yeah. role is to ask that question. That's wonderful. Okay. Last couple of questions. Uh, what's a movie or TV show? This can be serious or it can be something that just to switch off like a movie or TV show that's a favorite of yours. It'll, um, has had an influence on you. Um, I I love TV to completely switch off, so I probably watch a bit more terrible reality TV than I should. Although although I'm trying to steer myself away from that, one of my all time favourites, whenever it's on, is The Great British Bake Off. I love a sort of a, a reality cooking or baking show. I like to bake. It's light hearted. It's funny, and it's it's. Yeah, I enjoy TV to fully switch off and get some escapism, I think. I've never watched the great, is it great oh, British Bake Off? Is that what's called? Yeah, you are missing out. There's an Australian version and I will watch that, yeah. but the British one is the, I, it's the, the perfect one. I actually recommended it to okay. it someone, to someone earlier yeah. today. So, Okay, I will because yeah. I'm a fan. We have um, mm-hmm. my wife, uh, Liz and I, we have a six-week-old and uh our first uh, little boy roman so we're routines and nothing <laughs> happens when you when you have a new baby, baby. so what the, the, we're very thankful australia is and we love yep. reality uh, i say really enjoy switching off to reality tv but there's something about cooking i don't know what it is mm-hmm. maybe it's because we all do it like we all have to cook and you're watching normal people produce amazing things there's something about cooking shows that i really that's why yeah. i'm like okay maybe we really do need to get into the to the great british um, bake off because we've you do we love master chef so much so good recommendation <laughs> i think we will you're welcome <laughs> <laughs> last question uh if you one piece of leadership leader what would you say it's it's to any leader it's about having mentors coaches um it's it's about finding people um is that you can trust their advice that you want to hear their advice and and go to them but it's also about people who will encourage you and and sometimes it's also about finding sort of your cheerleaders those very early on someone said you need to find someone who will push your wheelbarrow and you do need sort of sometimes people who will sort of champion your cause and um, either encourage you personally or hear of opportunities or push put you forward for opportunities. So it's about having mentors for advice and cheerleaders to to support you and push you forward. And and actually, I'm going to, sorry, the third person you need to have or, or people you need to have are the people that you can just go and really offload to. 
and who will mm. listen to you, indulge you, but also tell you if you are overreacting or being ridiculous if you're a wrong or if you're wrong. So you need that sort of blunt sounding board as well. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's so good. I, I mean, I, I've heard it called um, yep. that, that, or the, or the friend who'll tell you that you've got something in your teeth. It's that relationship, right? Where <laughs> you, you're really yes. comfortable with each other. I'll say, hey, hey, you've like, um, that looks terrible. You need to fix that. Um, and, and you've yep. got that relationship and that does take, uh, uh when something a lot of leaders may not realize, realize particularly younger, uh, listeners is that when you, the leadership roles, it can be very lonely. And that's why I think that advice is such wonderful advice. Find those people when you're younger, find great people around you, mentors, mm -hmm. other people talk about reverse men, which is this idea of like having just amazing, amazing people younger than you, than you are, um, who you're purposefully looking to learn from and see through their eyes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But just, just being aware of the importance of who you have around you. And I like different people you mentioned there because you do need um, um, there are times, there are, <laughs> you do need that person who, no matter what happens, they'll say, you know what, like, you're amazing. You're, you're doing great. And then you, you also need that yes. person that you can then go to and say, wow, this will happen. And I go, you, and they're often different people. Yes, like definitely different people. And you have to learn who works for you and who fits, fits in all those categories for you. And it does, it takes time to build up that amazing team to support you. Absolutely. Well, for people who have really loved hearing some of your story and your wisdom on all things leadership, where can, uh, just wondering if there's anywhere online, LinkedIn or Twitter, and also for uh, Taz, where can people find out more and, uh, and, and follow you online? Yeah, absolutely. I'm, I am, I think I'm on Twitter, but I haven't been active on Twitter for a very long time. I just think I left my account. So don't look to say hello to me on there. I am on LinkedIn. People will be able to find me on LinkedIn. And um, yes, I'd, it would be wonderful if uh, if you looked up Taz, the Armadale School, you can find us online. Um, obviously, I'm biased, but it's a beautiful school. Um, but yes, if anyone wants to connect, I, I am on LinkedIn. You'll be able to find me there. Amazing. And a beautiful part of the world, Armadale, that a lot of listeners outside yes. of Australia may not know about. So um, mm -hmm. look up Armadale and of what you and the school are doing there. Yeah. Uh, well, I want to thank our listeners for tuning mm -hmm. in. Such a fun episode. Uh, great uh, to hear some of Rachel's story, uh, sport and um, and military and, and uh, yeah, just wonderful, wonderful advice. Um, embarrassing her friend Amy, which, which was a highlight, <laughs> which I love. <laughs> I always do love when someone really humble gets a big shout out and you just know they're, they're going to cringe um, because that brings joy to my heart. Uh, for our listeners, don't forget, I also have the John O'White Leadership Podcast and the Leadership Question of the Day Podcast. There are two other places you can go to invest in your leadership. But I want to finish today by saying a massive thank you to you, Rachel, for being so generous with your time, um, for sharing wonderful stories and for being a joy to spend time with. So thanks for coming on the podcast. Thank you so much for having me, Jono. It's been lovely. Thank you. Well, I hope you enjoyed that episode of the Leadership Conversations podcast as much as I did. If you're joining us for the first time, don't forget to check out consultclarity.org. That's our website, consultclarity.org. We have so many free resources on there, including our seven questions on leadership series. We've had more than 1,500 leaders from all over the world in all different roles, in different industries, answer these seven questions on leadership and leaders give these in-depth answers around how they spend their time, uh, a book that's been significant for them. It's just a gold mine. It's completely free to access. So go to consultclarity.org and look for that. We'd also love to interview you about your leadership. I believe your experience, your life, your context means that you have advice on leadership that other leaders can learn from. Yes, you, if you're going, not me. Well, no, I really believe you would have something to add. So if you're looking for a way to give back, it's completely free to get involved. And we would love to interview you through the seven questions on leadership. You just go to consultclarity.org forward slash seven dash questions dash interest 
or Google consultclarity.org seven questions interest and fill out the form and get involved. We have a free resource on our website called the Leadership Survival Guide. It's a 57 page ebook, 10 world-class leaders giving their thoughts on leadership and that's completely free. It's available on our homepage, consultclarity.org right at the top. So make sure you go and get that and download it today. And we have a free daily email that you can subscribe to. We send this out to over 15,000 leaders from around the world. And uh, it contains the highlights of content from our podcasts, our blogs, um, our books, books we're reading. It's got the best content and it gives you exclusive, limited, early access to our masterclasses, workshops, new products, special offers. It's all for our subscribers. You can go to consultclarity.org forward slash subscribe and join 15,000 other leaders. And you know, my gift to you is to work really hard, particularly through the Leadership Conversations podcast. I have been blown away by the quality of the leaders and I'm learning as much as anyone in doing these interviews. So I'm having a great time. And my gift to you is to keep lining up the best leaders I can to invest in your leadership. Your gift to me, if you're finding this helpful, there is something that you could do that would help us out massively. And that is to write a review and to leave a rating for our podcast or wherever you're watching or listening to this. I can't tell you how much that helps us out. Also subscribe or follow. It really does make a difference in helping us to help more leaders become everything they're meant to be. Another thing that means a lot to me personally is when I see our community share our content. So if you do share this or any other piece of content on social media, then thank you and and please do that. And look for me, John O'White or Clarity and tag us in your post. Our team is always looking for posts to engage with from our community. And there's also a chance that we'll share your content uh, to go beyond and share it with our followers. Last of all, you can check out my book. It's called Step Up or Step Out, How to Deal with Difficult People Even If You Hate Conflict. I wrote this book because 50% of the coaching sessions I have with leaders, this topic comes up again and again and again. And it's this idea of how do I have this difficult conversation? How do I lead this person better when I'm finding them difficult? Or in some cases you look and you say, I think I might be leading a difficult person. They're just quite difficult to lead or I'm finding them quite difficult to lead. So there's a three-step process that I unpack in step up or step out. And the amazing thing, and I've literally done this myself and I've heard it anecdotally from other leaders as I've coached them, is that if you follow this process, you will see that person step up and change their behavior or make a decision, which is to step out some of the time. Uh, 95% of the time, people will step up or step out in just four weeks. And I stand by that. It's uh, You have to read the book to understand, but uh, I really do believe in it and I've experienced it firsthand. It works. So you can go to Amazon, look up Step Up or Step Out John O'White or store.consultclarity.org forward slash book. Well, thank you so much for listening. We're going to be back with a new episode next time of the Leadership Conversations podcast. And I hope today has helped you to take another step towards becoming the leader you're meant to be. See you next time.